I now have the very great pleasure of introducing this evening's keynote speaker. Matthias Boschek is the Miles and Joan Jean McDonough uh, Director of the Worcester Art Museum. As you will read in your program, he came to New England a dozen years ago after a distinguished career in the Louvre and at, in St. Louis, uh, New, St. Louis, Missouri. And he's now ably guided WAM through a, a, a very challenging decade. There's no question about it, culminating, of course, in last year's uh, lockdown. So he's a, kindly agreed to share with us um, some of the art that is his favorite from the Worcester Art Museum and his thoughts on how cultural institutions like his are dealing with the opportunities and challenges of reopening and renewal. At the end of his remarks, um, Julie's going to uh, see if you have any questions in the chat. And if you do, she's going to do her level best to get to as many of the chat of the questions for Matthias um, as she can uh, in the time that we have. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to turn the stage over to Matthias Vasek. Thank you, Bonnie, for your wonderful introduction. Um, it's an honor to be with you. Um, and uh, it is also um, part of my way to thank you uh, for all the great work that ESC has been uh, doing for the Worcester Art Museum uh, and with us. Um, one second. Here we go. And uh, I wanted to um, first comment a little bit on that uh, film. You, you get two pieces of information about the Worcester Art Museum that are very important. Number one, our lifeblood is not tourism. Our lifeblood is the community or are the communities that we serve, which differentiates us from, say, the Met, beyond the size, obviously. And we get uh, um, beyond the size, we get something else. We get the intimacy of the viewing experience that the big museums oftentimes can't deliver on, particularly when there's so many tourists uh, going through those galleries. The other piece of information, and that truly sets the Worcester Art Museum apart, is that a third of our real estate is actually studio art classes. So the entryway that people have from the community uh, is via those studio art classes. And these things, of course, are shifting right now uh, uh, due to uh, COVID and uh, the IT revolution that COVID has pushed. And we will talk about this at the end of my presentation. So what I would like to do is I start uh, talk first First about the Worcester Art Museum's beginnings and the ambitions. I'll give you an overview of our collecting history and I am a little bit biased so I put my absolute favorites first um, and then um, uh, under planning for the future I'll talk a little bit about um, where uh, we, we are heading. So what you're seeing is a, is a world premiere. We haven't shown it with anybody from outside the museum. It's our iconic jersey banner in front of the building. We are uh, partnering um, uh, with the um, uh, with the Wusox. Uh, as you know, they have been relocating uh, to the Worcester, uh, to the uh, to the city of Worcester uh, in in uh, Canal in the Canal Street district, uh, and so we're showing a, a show an exhibition on the iconic jersey and that's going to open soon. Um, what you're seeing there is um, uh, the most iconic facade of, uh, the, uh, of our museum. It's on Salisbury Street uh, and that facade is from 1933 but the museum uh, was founded in 1896 and opened its the doors of its first building in 1898. And there's another thing that is very distinct about Worcester. Um, Normally museums constitute the bulk of their collection via gifts of donors. In our case, our local Brahmins have actually um, taken a completely different route with one exception about which I'm going to speak a little bit later. Um, they have uh, put a huge amount of resources to the museum and hired the best curators and hopefully the best directors that they could um, so that this co co collection would grow. At that time, uh, 1896, uh, all the big towns uh, had, big cities, had started their museums. The Met in the uh, 1870s, uh, Chicago, same decade, uh, St. Louis in the 1880s, uh, and so on and so forth. So we came later um, uh, but still in the uh, 19th century. Uh, and just to, to uh, memorize this, Worcester at that time had only 90,000 inhabitants. So we were pretty small. We are still not very big. Um, but uh, there was this, this outsized um, uh, ambition uh, to um, create a city that could culturally compete with the big guys. And now I show you how we competed. Um, 
So uh, this is in our Renaissance court, and some of you who had the opportunity to visit the museum uh, are familiar with this. This is our iconic uh, hunt mosaic. It's uh, from the uh, early sixth century uh, from a city called Antioch, which is in Southern Turkey. Now, the history of this is, the Worcester Art Museum at that time was collaborating with uh, the Walters in Baltimore, with Princeton, um, as well as the Louvre um, in Paris. Um, and uh, we got the lion's share uh, of this excavation. Uh, we have basically a, um, a, a tiny mosaic museum uh, uh, in our walls. Uh, every phase of mosaic producing from high uh, Republican uh, Roman uh, realism uh, to um, uh, Byzantine uh, abstraction. So this is uh, closer to the Byzantine abstraction. It's basically already uh, 600 uh, uh, our time is basically already the, uh, the, 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 the time of when, when Rome was divided into East and West Rome. And this is in the East Rome Byzantine uh, part. We bought things like um, tiny little Worcester, like Goya. <laughs> Um, with whom uh, the, the, the portrait of Fray Miguel Fernandez y Flores you see on the left. At the, at the same year, we also bought aggressively um, stars of American art, and it, it always goes along. So whilst we were bringing the, um, the local and uh, the global together, um, we were very much focused also on um, collecting uh, iconic American art. Uh, Winslow Homer uh, is one of the, the many watercolors that we have by Winslow Homer and uh, um, uh, by other um, uh, important American artists. I'll show you more. Again, the same year, I think that was in the uh, 1930s, we bought uh, this Egyptian uh, um, royal descendant, uh, Heleferes, from about 2440 before our time. That same year, we bought Edward Hicks, this delightfully naive, uh, peaceable kingdom. Uh, so American art, he's from Philadelphia. I love this uh, amphora, the Heracles uh, amphora, uh, about 500 uh, before our time. And we bought that again at the same time as we bought an Aztec composite animal uh, from the late 15th and early 16th century, um, so from, uh, from Mexico. And then we have many firsts at the museum. We were the first museum uh, that bought in, the, in this country that bought a Gauguin. Uh, we were also the first uh, who, that bought a Claude Monet painting. Um, 1910 or something like this. So this painting was barely dry from the easel and we had it. At the same time, uh, we bought um, works by uh, Whistler. And of course, uh, Whistler always said that he felt that he was born in St. Petersburg and not in Lowell, I think, um, but he's actually American. So uh, <laughs> we, can, we can say we, we enriched our American collection uh, with him. And then I'm talking about more recent uh, uh, developments uh, that happened since I uh, started at the Worcester Art Museum. Um, so my, my, on my day minus five, um, uh, I had already a meeting uh, with the board president of the Higgins Armory uh, and the interim director. And we were discussing the potential uh, merger of the uh, Higgins collection uh, with the Worcester Art Museum. So what you're seeing on the right-hand side is it's on view in our medieval galleries currently. It comes, it's actually Renaissance. Uh, it comes from, uh, Nuremberg and uh, the bourgeois of Nuremberg uh, felt that they had to do something that normally is reserved for aristocrats, which is jousting. Nowadays it would be golfing. Those days they didn't golf, they jousted. Um, and if you get close to this uh, outfit, you see some very heavy impacts uh, from nasty neighbors uh, fighting um, uh, with each other. Um, uh, uh, top left, uh, you see a Japanese helmet. So the Japanese generals, they had always to be uh, recognized by their own troops, which is dangerous because the enemy can also recognize them, but they have these outlandish helmets and we have several of those. Uh, then a gladiator helmet that um, made, makes everybody who loves uh, Roman antiquity uh, uh, swoon, uh, collectors and, and uh, lovers of this material. Then uh, a Northern, uh, um, uh, sub-Saharan helmet that is uh, comparable to what was uh, produced in, in Russia and in, um, uh, uh, in uh, the Middle East. Um, uh, it's like Shistak helmets. And then at the bottom, you see a Mogul uh, quiver uh, from the uh, 18th century. So um, uh, uh, John Woodman Higgins, uh, he is the exception. Uh, he uh, owned uh, Worcester steel um, and um, 
uh, he uh, made a huge fortune. Worcester, among the things that Worcester produced was barbed wire for the westward expansion. Um, and they needed a lot of barbed wire down in Kansas uh, and maybe also in Texas. So um, uh, he had a showroom on his, uh, on his, uh, on the, on, in his plant where he showed exquisite uh, crafts work. Um, uh, and so uh, he collected, not uh, as a collector, he, he, he bought collections by others uh, at a time when uh, that was possible. So this is now in our collection, has transformed us. Uh, we've become much more family friendly. Uh, and it also was a lever to, to make the museum more outward facing. Then, this is a historic moment, um, uh, hasn't, I mean, we got international press for it. Um, uh, five years ago, uh, our uh, chief conservator has uh, attributed with a scholar from Yale, uh, this panel to Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and uh, this panel, um, we have the smallest, we're in the illustrious club of Leonardo da Vinci, painting owners, um, and we have the smallest. I mean, you have to stand out some way, no? So uh, size-wise, again, we are standing out. And uh, this work was uh, on view at the Leonardo da Vinci retrospective at the uh, Louvre uh, in Paris, and about 1.2 million people walked past it and saw the name Worcester. We have also made uh, huge efforts in uh, inserting the female voice into our collection. Uh, so in 19, uh, we bought uh, this, the work on the right-hand side, Gabriele Münter. She is part of the Blauer Reiter, uh, the Munich uh, movement. She was the girlfriend of uh, Vasily Kandinsky. And at that time, their works uh, in 09, their works were interchangeable. And it was not always that uh, Kandinsky inspired Münter. It was also the other way around. And on the left-hand side, Paula Modersohn Becker, not a household name in America. She is the, 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 the mother or the grandmother of German expressionism. Um, and so uh, we had some holes in the um, early uh, 20th century, uh, European 20th century, um, and we are filling this systematically with a female voice. Um, and in addition to that... Um, yeah. uh, how many more um, pieces do you think you'll have to be able to show us? Because I do want to start to see if people have questions for you. Uh, okay, I have this one, and then I come to question. Then I come to the future. Oh, do you want me to abbreviate, or do you want me to abbreviate, or Let's do this last one? That'll be perfect. Thank you, Matthias. Okay. Sorry that it, uh, I, I talked for so long. I had timed it before. I'm very sorry. So uh, we also are looking at, um, uh, under the auspices of uh, the AI, um, uh, at um, uh, giving a stronger voice uh, to minorities uh, in this country, because uh, you may have heard a lot of people from minorities when they go to a museum say, I don't see myself here. And so uh, the left, on the left, um, this is a work that we also bought in 19 uh, by Gammon. Uh, he's New York based, or oh, he was New York based, the whole family and the date it's the year after Martin Luther King gave his speech I have a dream and on the right hand side um, it's uh, is from Wadsworth Gerald um, uh, black family and it is a uh, work that actually celebrates families uh, and so you have the, the the dark and the light side um, uh, uh, of yeah the dark and the light side uh, um, uh, side by side um, planning for the future um, we have I, I just categorized it, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I would say belonging for museums is very important, um, is something that every museum is looking at, uh, uh, not only outward facing, but inward facing. Um, we have to work with shift of expectations. People don't expect necessarily to learn, they expect to have an experience that is relevant to them, uh, and interactivity is very important in that uh, context. We need to become a tech competent organization and um, that need became blatantly obvious uh, during the lockdown mm -hmm. and uh, uh, many uh, uh, organizations are struggling with this um, uh, because the old uh, philanthropic system uh, is uh, shifting uh, and we have to uh, identify new income sources so these are the things that not just the worst art museum uh, uh, is dealing with but museums all over the country that was my presentation i'm again i apologize for having been no a little bit too long. Apology. Matthias, and in fact, those issues are ones that not just cultural institutions and museums are facing, uh, but those are issues that most nonprofits are dealing with. They really are. So thank you for that. Um, thank you very much for that. 